So welcome to RIVE, Reflections in Veterinary Education. Um, this is Bobby Connor here. I'm super excited to welcome Misty Bailey, who is going to be our guest for today. And um, yeah, so what, we, what we've been doing with this podcast is we've, we're trying different things, um, talking about different things. But one of the things that we've been really excited about is the opportunity to bring on various folks from the veterinary education world and ideally from like different backgrounds and to just kind of hear a little bit about what brought you into veterinary education. And um, Missy, I'm, I'm fascinated. I'm always fascinated to hear about people's stories, but in particular, um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing your story. And because um, we've kind of gotten to know each other fairly well over the last few years mm -hmm. um, through CVAC, but I, I feel like there's going to be a lot of surprises today. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this. Um, we, why, why don't we take a moment, though, um, for Misty, just tell us a little bit of what you're doing right now, like what your role is right this moment. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, yeah, so I work at the University of Tennessee College of Veterinary Medicine, and I've been the curriculum and assessment coordinator there for six and a half years now. Um, and recently um, fell into an assistant professor practice role. So I'm really excited about Ooh, that. Congratulations. Um, but mostly what I've been doing over the six years is um, related to program evaluation. And part of that is curriculum and assessment. Um, so I'm sort of the, the one stable person who stays on our curriculum committee when other people cycle off. Love that. Um, the same with you. You're probably the stable person in, in like through multiple definitions of that. Right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's Maybe. a multi-layered con Maybe. comment. <laughs> I want right. to point out for people who are, are listening or watching right now that you're not a veterinarian, right? That's uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. I think that's what's important um, because, you know, those that are, are veterinarians that are listening, um, you know, one of the things we commonly talk about is like, yeah, I'm an expert in veterinary medicine, but I'm not an expert in teaching. But that's mm -hmm. where Misty and, and, and people like you, like you are an expert in teaching. And, and that's where I think that's the complementary kind of teamwork approach to veterinary education. Um, this is, this is one of the, the highlights for me. So I, I just wanted to point that out. That was, I, I think an important distinction that not everybody listening maybe knows. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, my doctoral degree is in higher education administration. And I have a bachelor's and a master's degree in English literature. So I started out teaching college students composition and literature. I love it. I love it. So I, I feel yeah. that the the folks that have the right brain, left brain balance, right? Like how well you did on the SAT qualitative portion as opposed <laughs> to the quantitative. Like, I think that's important, you know, like the people who are pure scientists, I mean, they're great, I love them, but I feel <laughs> that the people who are English majors, like I, I would rather work with English major turned scientists than like a pure scientist. <laughs> Well, because there's really no such thing, right? Like you can't, like, what what good is it to do science and not be able to communicate it with anybody else? Like, it, yeah, exactly. It's cool. Um, it right, nobody knows what's going on. I know, and it's it's a problem. Um, so, so Misty, maybe you can go a little bit deeper. Dig a little bit deeper. You told us a little mm -hmm. bit about where you were before, but, um, you know, your professional progression. Like, what was what was your what was your trajectory, and why veterinary medicine? Yeah, so when I was in college, I was majoring in a pre-pharmacy field. So I wanted to be a pharmacist. All right, all right. So my undergraduate studies were heavily science-based. Um, I got into organic chemistry and decided, you know what? This is not for me. Oh. <laughs> that happens a lot. A lot of people say that. Yeah. So, I mean, I was I was doing a, a part-time jobs at at various different pharmacies. I had an interview for pharmacy school and at the, I guess a week before the interview, I decided I'm going to change my major and I need to figure out what I'm passionate about. And I am passionate about writing and discussing big ideas um, and literature enabled me to do that. So I didn't really think about, you know, what the heck are you going to do when you graduate? How are you going to get a job with a bachelor's degree in English? 
Um, but then that led to a master's degree in English. And that's where I got the opportunity to have a teaching assistantship. Excellent. So that's where I really got into teaching. Um, we were given two courses of our very own, two composition courses of our very own in the set um, in the second year, um, both semesters, and and really trained on how to be a a good sort of tutor for students nice. who were writing, um, how not to edit their work, but to get them where they needed to be and improving their work, um, and then also sort of shadowing other teachers within the department and and really learning how to teach. Um, but I was doing a lot of, once I graduated, I was doing a lot of adjunct work. Yeah. And anybody in academia knows that academic um, adjunct work is not stable. And so I was looking for something permanent, you know, I'd like a retirement fund and, you know, some paid <laughs> time off and sick leave, that sort of thing. Seems uh, <laughs> yeah, so a job came open in CVM for a science editor, and I honestly did not even know what CVM stood for. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, love it, love it. <laughs> so I applied for that job, got it, and then served as a science editor at the College of Veterinary Medicine at Tennessee for 10 years. Oh. Uh, and you kind of had a healthcare, you know, you were thinking pharmacy, so it, it's not as, as far-fetched as, uh, so even though you... You have obviously probably when you applied for the job, you learned what the acronym CVM stood for, right? I did. I did. And it didn't scare you away. You're like, okay, this is maybe, you know, maybe they, they'll be okay with me not having, you know, loved organic chemistry, but at least you had, you had some background in that for a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I did. So coming on board, it, it felt like it was a really easy transition because I had been teaching composition for a while and and people just started handing me these manuscripts and I started doing editing for journal articles and um, huge NIH grants. And, wow. and I'll never forget the very first time I heard or read the term nude mouse. I've never <laughs> heard of that before. Yep. I, I Googled it. Who knows what the results <laughs> were, but um, I was, I was imagining a very cold mouse, you know, with no clothes on. Um, and turns out I know what that means now. Um, but yeah, I feel like I learned a lot over those 10 years in uh, yeah. really figuring out how veterinary medicine works, um, research in veterinary medicine, and, and was really fortunate to have um, India Lane mm -hmm. as a connection early on. And yeah. she was able to kind of rope me into contributing to the master teacher program that she had just developed at the time. Excellent. And is that kind of what led to then the later transition from like into your current position? Was that like India kind of mm -hmm. pulled you in on the master teacher program? And then when something a little bit more specific to education opened up, boom, there you were. Yeah, exactly. Um, when I came in, we were in the middle of um, applying for um, sort of the Tennessee Baldridge equivalent um, mm -hmm. for excellence. Um, performance excellence teams. Okay. And so they were in the process of combine, compiling this giant document to, to apply for that distinction. And so she and I were working together a lot at that time. And she learned that I had that teaching experience and, and I was still passionate about teaching, just not getting to do it anymore. And so, yeah, she um, offered me a spot on the planning committee for that. And and it's been um, over 10 years now, and I'm still in that planning committee. <laughs> He's a clever one. In yeah, India. Can I just interject here that I feel like many, many roads in veterinary education lead to India Lane. <laughs> yeah. I agree. Like, to, from, literally. through. Yeah. Yeah. Literally. She's a clever yeah. one. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think she's good at identifying talent and saying, Oop, uh, all right, you, you're with me. <laughs> right. Well, I yeah. mean, honestly, though, part of that is comes from, so actually when I was a, a fourth year vet student, I was interested, well, I was getting ready to be a fourth year vet student. I was interested in doing external rotations that weren't offered on campus because I had that opportunity through Texas A&M. And um, one of the people that I talked to was India Lane because I was interested in veterinary education even then. And we actually were trying to sort of figure out how we could potentially do like a one year veterinary education internship. And it unfortunately didn't happen. But yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I met India back in 2007 and here I am, you know, 15 years later, still working with her and finding other people that have scattered and 
Oh, mm-hmm. I know Neely. No, I don't know Neely. And she was the one who got me to do this or she taught me to do that. So I think mm-hmm. that's yeah, she's Pretty a cool. clever one. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's she's great, great having yeah. her as a um an organic mentor as yeah, as we say. Yeah. I like that. Nice. What uh, I have, I have some other questions, but I want to give uh, uh, Eric and Catherine a, a chance uh, to ask, ask Misty any other follow up questions or what so you were serving as a grant writer assistant for 10 years. So what did you learn about veterinary medicine and veterinary education in that time span that kind of affected your future? Yeah, so I, I am a dog lover. <laughs> I have a very unhealthy obsession with dogs. <laughs> um, so I, you know, when I interviewed for the job and found out that I would be working at a veterinary school, I was thrilled. <laughs> um, and and I realized from editing that veterinary medicine and the opportunities that veterinary education can give graduates is so much more than private practice mm-hmm. for cats and dogs. Um, which is sort of the opinion that I had when I came in in 2006. Um, So, you know, um, comparative research, um, public health, and all those things I just had no idea about. So it just really showed me the breadth of what a veterinary degree could do for somebody's career. I have a question about what prompted you to pursue your uh, terminal degree in education, because you your background is in English, mm-hmm. um, and you are a science writer, editor, those types of things. Um, so, and and you aren't doing a lot of teaching per se. So, I'm just curious as to, I mean, I love the fact that you finished it up, but I just am curious about what it was that inspired you or motivated you to to do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I I had kind of floated along. Um, I'm not a really long-term planner. I just kind of floated along. Um, I had a, uh, the master's degree and people kept saying, why don't you have a PhD? And I'm like, I don't want a PhD. Why would I want to do that to myself? You know, five years of hard work and a dissertation. And, ugh, that's okay. Um, but I went to a, a leadership institute that the University of Tennessee system put on in 2015. And it was people from all over the UT system. So people from Memphis, Knoxville, Tullahoma, Chattanooga, um, UT Martin. And all these people came together for an entire week together. And nobody got into a fight. So that was great, right? (laughs) After spending a week together. Um, And I think that opportunity made me realize that I could do more. And I, in my mind, I wanted to do more. um, And I just didn't know exactly how to get there. And so that really made me realize, okay, I I have more to learn. Um, The program that I went into, the classes that I took initially helped me on the job immediately. Um, And it it had a leadership approach, um, an assessment approach. And I enjoyed it. I was actually sad when the coursework was over. I wish I could go back and do another one, but but absolutely no way. <laughs> <laughs> so you audit well, some courses. Yeah. So what do you mean that the the classes you were taking helped you immediately? Can you maybe give us a little? Sure. More? Sure. Um, so I won't lie, since I'm not a good planner, I missed the deadline to apply for the <laughs> precise program that I wanted. <laughs> so I applied as a non degree seeking student. Um, which was sort of to my benefit because when I would talk to the advisor for that exact program, she would say, okay, I want you to be with your cohort. I want you to take this first and this second and this third. And I would think to myself, "Mm, but statistics would be more helpful. (laughs) Um, So I just sort of went rogue and and did whatever I wanted because I had no real advisor. (laughs) Um, So yeah, I I started out with statistics and program evaluation. and I kept putting off the ethics class because I said, you know what, I've, I've, been, I've been doing research ethics and authorship ethics for the last 10 years. I know this stuff. I don't have anything else to learn. This is a waste of my time. And they kept telling me, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when funny. I finally got into that class, I realized it could apply across all facets of life. And it had nothing to do with research ethics. <laughs> so it was great. <laughs> 
and ended up with um, being the impetus for what I'm teaching now. So it was perfect. Very cool. Thanks for that. Yeah. Well, that's a lovely segue. And tell us uh, a little bit about what um, what are your teaching responsibilities now? Yeah. So over the years, I've I've dabbled in some problem based learning. So um, at Tennessee, we call those ABLES application based learning experiences. So I've served as, as a facilitator for those for um, a few times, even before transitioning into this role. And um, now I'm a course coordinator for the professional skills, wellness and ethics course series for the second year students. So spring, well, fall and spring of second year, um, those poor students are stuck with me as their course coordinator. Um, so fall is largely focused on euthanasia, which was really difficult. Um, mm -hmm. for somebody like me. Um, but we also incorporate ethical decision making into that and um, try to tie that all together with euthanasia. Um, in the spring, we transition to more of things like um, self-directed learning. Um, last year, I put in a um, cyberbullying mm -hmm. um, unit. Um, and we also talk about um, relationships with vendors mm. when you're out in the profession mm. and conflict of interest related to that. Very cool. So where do you where do you come up with the the content for for this course? Um, and you know, not that obviously you have to be a veterinarian to, to think through some of these things, but it may mm -hmm. not always be immediately obvious, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, how are you, um, you know? working with others in the profession to say, okay, what are the needs or, or what is missing in the curriculum or yeah, how, how do you approach that? So a few years ago, we, we had two separate courses. We had a, a professional skills and yeah, professional skills course, and then a wellness and ethics course separately. Okay. And they, they sort of started out having a a common theme, but they diverted from that theme over the years and they really had no connection whatsoever to each other. Mm -hmm. So we decided as a group, so I guess the course coordinators at the time sat down with me um, being on the, the stable person on the curriculum committee. Um, we all sat down together and, and looked at the AAVMC um, domains mm -hmm. as well as the AVMA competencies and tried to determine what are we not teaching yeah. within other courses and how can we put these into a new course series that students will take for their first four semesters. So we were really looking for content that was not being taught elsewhere in the curriculum. And that's how it all came about. And then we sort of figured out, okay, how do we divide this up into years and semesters so that it makes sense timing wise um, and all that. So we definitely had lots of input from several different folks. Nice. So you started with what is the need? You know, what's the content? What are the, uh, um, you know, objectives that that we're not necessarily meeting yet and and kind of work backwards from there? Love it. That's Correct. great. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe give us some insight into how your students view that particular course? And, um, and the reason I ask that is because we have a similar course, right, at Virginia mm -hmm. Tech, and it's one of the most poorly rated courses. And it's not because the people who instructed are poor, it's because mm -hmm. students don't seem to understand the value of it. And mm -hmm. there's some scheduling. At least not when they take it, they don't. Right, right. It's right. one of those things that they Precisely. come back and realize the value of later and, and, and not always terribly later because we do like contract discussions and those kinds of things, which mm -hmm. as they move into their third, particularly their fourth years, they're finding to be very valuable, but, but how, so like, yeah. So tell us what the experience is with those students. And if you have had any of those challenges or kind of what your mm -hmm. experience is in that way. Yeah. What you're describing sounds really familiar. Um, that's <laughs> what we were hearing for the course series originally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this doesn't apply to me. I need to be studying anatomy. I need to be studying cardiology. Um, and you know, I don't want to be here. Right. Um, so what we decided we would do is really emphasize the competencies and the domains that mm -hmm. are expected from the AAVMC and the AVMA. Smart. So we make sure we put that in the syllabi for all the courses. We make sure we talk about that on the first day. 
Um, this semester, for the first time, I decided I would incorporate the AVMA ethical guidelines. And so at the beginning of the semester, I said, okay, you guys are going to get one of the guidelines every week in an email from me because we don't wow. have time to cover all these in class. Mm -hmm. So I just set them all up. They go out every week and we got through all of them in a semester. Now, do they read them? I have no idea, <laughs> <laughs> but at least they're getting that information in small chunks. Yeah. So trying to emphasize the importance of it. Um, I try to bring outside speakers in who've had real experience with these things so that they can see how it will be applicable to them when they graduate. Mm -hmm. And I tell them that the most important thing for me in order for them to be successful in the course is to think. Mm -hmm. okay. I just want them to think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I ask you that selfishly because I'm getting ready to take that course over. So <laughs> mm -hmm. thank you for all those lovely ideas. I'm also thinking in my head about doing some case-based approaches to to it, right? Yeah. So you guys are incorporating euthanasia and that kind of thing. And I'm wondering if on the first day of class, I walk in and I have yep. an emergency dog who's been hit by a car that has no tags and nobody knows who's the own, who the owner yep. is. The dog is getting, you know, ready to arrest. What do you do? And, and then sort of working them through that and saying, right. what are ethical decision-making yep. points? What are, what are the potential legal implications? What are, you know, X, Y, and Z? How are you going to communicate this? Because the owner is eventually going to find you like all those things. And yeah. so- I love it, Catherine. That's what I had in my head. I was like, you need to come in and present them with like a real situation, right? And like, yeah. if you ever need any real crazy situations, give me a holler and I will give you okay. tons of real Perfect. ones. Um, I might take you up on that too, if that extends please to me. Please do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Happy to share. I have some crazy stories and they're real. Um, yeah. And so, uh, but yeah, just like, okay, here's the situation. What do you do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Boom. Are you ready for this? Okay. Well, this right. is what we're going to talk through over the rest of the semester, right? Like this, yeah. this is not that you're going to be ready for all eventualities, but we want you to get through. How do you think through, how are you going to solve this? Because we're, there's no way we can prepare you for all of the crazy scenarios that you're going to be in. And right. you Absolutely. will, and you will, um, and I'll share with you some, some ones that I've been in and, and you're going to be like, that's not, no, it, it's, there's no point in making them up. I have too right. many real ones. <laughs> Um, to share. And yeah, so I, my head went exactly where yours did, Catherine, uh, because you, how do you, how do you make it something that they value? You go, well, this is why it matters. Do you feel ready um, when the client comes in screaming at you for X, Y, and Z, or, you know, what are you going to do when, you know, you're sitting there and the, the, the client and their, um, you know, all of their, their kids are out there on the farm with you you while you're talking about what we're going to do with, you know, uh, the horse, who, who, like, what, what are you going to do? Are you ready for this? And, you know, I think when you put them in that situation, I mean, like, cause students ask me all the time, what do you do when this, how do you handle this? What are you going to say when that? So they are thinking about it, but if we can present it in a way that right. they go, yeah, 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 you're right. I do need this and I'm not ready for it yet. The anatomy is important, but the, nobody cares about the anatomy. If you can't communicate that, or you can't apply it to the actual situation. Right. Yeah. One of, the, one of the exercises that I would do with the anesthesia course the first day is I would say, okay, sit and talk to the people around you and tell us about a time when anesthesia did not go well. Yeah. And then I would, you know, kind of be like, okay, who wants to share a story? And everyone has a story of anesthesia going horribly. Oh, yeah. So you can extend that to anything. Like you, you yep. can extend it to when did communication not go well? Like when yep. did like finance talks not go well? Like everyone has those stories if they spend time in a clinic. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Don't get me wrong, Misty. I'm totally going to steal some of your ideas. Like I'm yeah. going to emphasize, I'm going to emphasize Go for it. competencies. I'm going to make sure they know. It. You know, it's not just about competencies, but also there's a reason these competencies are there. But yeah, my head went immediately to the sort of case based first day of class. Mm -hmm. Boom, here's your case. And then they're going to be like, well, why are you giving me this case in class? Well, let's talk about it. Look at the competencies yeah. that are here. Exactly. Are That's you set them up with mm -hmm. that. And then you and then you bring it back and they go, oh, OK. Right. Yeah. And then right. what happens if the person who's screaming and crying at you is speaking to you in a language that is not English and you don't understand it? Right. Like, mm -hmm. yep. how do you manage that? So. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'd say like you. four stories come to mind. I'm like, oh, I bet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, so, fun time. Yeah, we also talk about, so I put up a picture of two, you know, fictitious people I just pulled off the internet, right? <laughs> um, and say, okay, you're making a hiring decision. Here uh, are your two choices. Oh, I love that. That's great. Um, you have Nathan, who is, um, has great experience. Um, he's kind of introverted. He, he does his job really well. He goes home, but then you have Tammy who has a lot of things common with your staff, 
Um, but she has just as much experience as Nathan. Um, Nathan lost his job, but Tammy just wants to move to a practice closer to home. Who do you hire? That's a great oh, scenario. Love it. Love and it. so, you know, it seems very clear to them at first. And I then I say, is this an ethical decision? I'm like, no, that's not an ethical decision. It's really? What, what <laughs> values are you using to make that decision? Oh, nice. Yeah. And I, I wonder if that's an opportunity to talk about implicit bias as well. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. So much. That's a great one. All right. Yeah. Filing that one away. I, yeah. My thing to do is steal great ideas from other people. Um, yeah. That's what we're here for. Absolutely. Well, I mean, and, and it is right. This is why we share. This is why we talk about different things. You're like, oh, that's great. Um, I have so many great things I've stolen from people over the years. And so I like, it's so funny. You try to give people credit. And then over time, you're like, I don't even remember where I stole it. <laughs> yeah. Um, this one, but this one will know, right? Well, this one will be <laughs> oh, yeah. Posterity. Yeah. I'm no, like, I'll have to go back and listen to this podcast before next year. <laughs> no, who cares? Yeah. I, I, like, I mean, steal. If I, if I'm doing something worth stealing, please steal it. Like, yeah. You know, I definitely, it probably wasn't really mine anyway. So um, yeah, pay it, pay it forward. Oh, that's awesome. Um, okay. So I want to go a little broader um, moving, moving next. So what Misty would you characterize as the biggest challenges um, that we are facing in veterinary education? Like what, what are the biggest challenges you think we're facing right now? That's a big, big, it's a big one, but yeah, take yeah. a moment if you need to. Um, I, I think student debt, I mean, I think that's what, I think that's what most people would say. Um, something that I'm really passionate about. So I came from a, a really rural, um, tiny, tiny town, small, tiny high school, um, consider myself to be a socioeconomic class migrant. And then I stole that term from Josh Rowe from Texas Tech. Uh, <laughs> um, Thanks. And it, I worry that um, one of the reasons that we might be such um, in such need of more um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is that we are somehow excluding those people who can't get here for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so, you know, if, if you're um, a student who can't afford the health insurance, for example, that you have to have, or or the series of rabies vaccinations that you have to have, um, how does that hinder you becoming a veterinarian, and and how does that contribute to your debt overall, and and how do you rebound from that? So, I'm really passionate about trying to help those students who might be marginalized in some way, even if it's just one or two students a year, you know, that we can help in some way. I feel like we're making a real difference, not just in, you know, helping with that student debt or um, helping that student to succeed, but also helping with the, the diversity and marginalized communities that we don't really see pursuing veterinary medicine. Can I, can I speak to that? Uh, so what do you tell the pre-vet students who are like, I've applied to my in-state school, I've applied to my in-state school, all I want to do is be a veterinarian here's my four hundred thousand dollars right to go to a private school like that i struggle with those students so much so i'm curious what you would have to say to them oh wow so i'll be honest i don't do a lot of student student recruiting i don't i don't talk to a ton of students um through the admissions process i do participate in admissions interviews and um, i've done some tours for students who are thinking about coming to veterinary school from the I guess, middle school, all the way up to undergraduate level. Um, and I've definitely heard some of them talk about their financial challenges. Um, you know, if you're, if you're able to make it, if you're able to get into veterinary school, I really, really, and this may just be me being naive or, or extra hopeful or a crazy optimist, but I really feel like it's it's going to work out for you. Um, if you if you get in there, you're good enough to get in. You work hard while you're there. You're going to get a good job. You're going to be able to pay off those loans. Um, and maybe maybe that's crazy. Um, but yeah, yeah. deep in my heart, I hope it works out. Yeah, I you know I think that I think that's a lovely idea. I'm not sure it's a hundred percent 
accurate, especially given interest rates and, and their sort of change. And, yeah. I, and I wonder, I wonder, so it was interesting because Eric and I were having a little sort of conversation before the both of you got on, you may have caught the end of it, Misty, about what are the, what are the things that we need to do to make sure that those students are provided access and provided an education in veterinary medicine in a way that, that doesn't put them $400,000 in debt, right? So mm -hmm. I, I agree that that student debt is a huge issue. I, I would almost, I would push further and say that the overarching way that we deliver veterinary education is the problem. It's not sustainable and it's not sustainable um, from a financial perspective. Very expensive, very it's not, expensive. Yeah, it's not sustainable for the, the academic perspective. We just, we can't hire and retain the kind of people that we think we need to hire and retain. And so um, I, I, I also really, and, and because I'm one of those students, like I, I honestly didn't know that milk didn't come powdered until I was in kindergarten, right? Like we, we literally didn't have real milk until I went to school and then I was on free lunch. And that's when I discovered that real milk actually existed. Um, and so, I, you know, I come, I, I'm also a socioeconomic social climber, what, whatever that phrase was that Josh Rowe used, um, migrant. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think about that a lot too. And so it's, mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear you say that and be concerned about that. But I, I think it's a much bigger systemic issue than, than just that. Yeah. And yeah, to your point, um, if you are someone who cannot, just absolutely cannot afford to go to school for four years without working, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's almost impossible. Yeah. And I know we have a lot of students who work over their summers and, and some who do some moonlighting at local veterinary clinics or as servers at restaurants or, or whatever, but um, in a perfect world, they wouldn't have to make that choice. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and or they'd be doing it part-time and they could make that choice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. I, Misty, I, I tend to be a bit of an optimist like you are as well. And where I'm like, yeah, if we can, if we can get them in and, and they can get through and they'll, they will, are you going to be a bajillionaire? No, like veterinary medicine, um, isn't necessarily a great financial decision, but you know, I, I didn't make the decision for financial reasons and I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm still paying my loans. Um, and you know, <laughs> I, it's, it still costs more every month than my mortgage, but, um, I, I don't regret that in any way, shape or form. However, I guess what I've also come to realize is if we're only looking at the people who have gone to vet school, um, right. You're, we're already selecting for people who, who still had some opportunities or some support or some means. And, and I think what we are missing out on is all of the people who, never even have the opportunity to apply or don't believe they do or, you know, whatever those, those are the exactly. barriers that I think that we're really missing out on, um, with the financial burden of vet school and, and, and the debt that you take on afterwards, because you also, you know, another, you know, difference in our program, uh, in the, in the U S versus maybe some, uh, overseas programs where you've got four years potentially of undergrad debt or three or four years of debt from undergrad before you even right. get to the behemoth that is veterinary school. Mm -hmm. And so, you, you know, that that's just insurmountable for some people to even consider it as an option. And so I think, um, as much as I, I do tend to agree, like if you can get to the point of getting in and things like that, you're, you're probably the, that the vast majority are going to be okay. Um, we're, who are we missing out on even before we get to that point? And, and that's, um, I think that's one of the real tragedies and one of the barriers to increasing, you know, diversity, equity, and include, I mean, by definition, right. We're, we're, we're this is not inclusive. We, it's, it's right. not inclusive. And, yeah. and if we're not providing the support that the, the varying degrees of support that different people need, then we're not being equitable mm -hmm. either. So, um, and those two things will, will stifle diversity in a lot of ways, whether that is, you know, racial or ethnic diversity, socioeconomic diversity. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it's really, I think it's great that you recognize that and, and point that out, especially as somebody who didn't go through that and isn't necessarily, um, you know, like you didn't personally experience the, the, I'm sure you, I'm sure you had loans and I'm sure you had debt. I don't mean yeah. to, to dis discount that, but I think it's really easy for people outside of the profession to uh -huh. not be acutely aware of it. Um, so I, I, I really appreciate that, that you are, and that you're thinking about that. What, um, you, you know, you mentioned like trying to help a couple of students and I agree. Yeah, do that. So what are, what are some of the things that you are doing? Um, or, or if, 
what would you do, um, even on a small scale? Yeah, I mean, the University of Tennessee does some things to help students out. We have a, a thing called Smokey's Pantry. So students can go, you know, if they're um, having issues with food security, they can go to Smokey's Pantry and, and get things from there. We also have Smokey's Closet. Of course, Smokey is our, um, our hound dog mascot for the university, um, beloved hound dog. And Smokey's Closet is a way for students to go get free clothing items that people have donated. So professional attire, so that if they are going for an interview and they can't necessarily afford a really nice suit or whatever, they can just go and, and get that from Smokey's Closet. Um, we also have some short, well, yeah, short-term loan programs through our college. So students who have financial need can apply for those and basically, you know, pretty much just get a check written that very day um, that they pay back before they graduate. Um, but, you know, there, there are other things that um, folks can do just personally to help students along. Um, if you're mentoring a student, telling them about your own struggles, um, how you met the challenge. Um, if you know of resources available that maybe others have not told them about, share that. Yeah, I love that. And I will say that the two optimists in the room have convinced me that the students who get in are probably going to be okay. But that, yes, we are missing out on a bunch of students who yeah. might not, you know, get in otherwise. So, so thanks for that. <laughs> Yeah, there's exceptions, but you know, but yeah, I mean, I think I, I do immediately kind of go to this, those people who graduate that maybe haven't passed the Navali or something, but I still yeah. think there's opportunities for them yeah. to obtain, yeah. you know, it was, it's really interesting. I was at a conference. Um, I went to Ted women a few years ago and one of the women that I met that was there is, um, sort of high up on the food chain at Citibank. And we were having a conversation about the amount of debt that students have. And she mentioned to me, and this has really been impactful to me is that the majority of student debt, the, the majority of students who take out student loans and fail to repay them actually have less than $10,000 in student loan debt. Wow. And the reason for that is because the students who have less than $10,000 in student loan debt did not complete their degree and therefore mm -hmm. do not have the means to obtain the type of job that would allow them to pay that debt back. And mm -hmm. so I think that um, is something that we should all be keeping in our heads, right? So again, that, that I think that supports the two optimists too, and that idea that those people who mm -hmm. make it in are probably going to be okay. It's those people who don't make it. And that's what I where I get concerned is those students who now have this wonderful right. piece of paper that says them they're entitled to be called a doctor, but they really can't do all of the things that come along with being a doctor. So definitely. Yeah, oh, I, I actually worry as much about the students who go to usually private uh, schools and don't make it through. Yeah. You know, so yeah. if you get to fourth year and you fail out after having gone to a uh, private school, now you're 300 grand in the hole and you do not have a high income profession mm -hmm. that you can enter. Yeah. It's like uh, the med students who could, don't match for residency yeah. that yeah. this is a, this is a problem. Yeah. And that may be one of the reasons that there's that failure to fail, right? We don't want to, mm -hmm. because we're, as a general rule, Especially we're just that not people, right? Like mm -hmm. we don't want somebody to be $300,000 in debt and not, it, that's a real ethical decision point for us mm -hmm. as it instructors is. and as people in the vet schools. Like, yeah. do we send this person out into the cold with $300,000 in debt and no degree, or do we potentially unleash somebody on our profession that is a liability, right? That's a huge yeah. decision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fortunately, not very often, but when it yeah, does, it's 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 pretty rare. Um, especially when they get that far along in the program, I you know, it, hopefully it gets rarer and rarer as you move along. Yeah. But, um, but yeah. it, it's not zero, right? Um, right. those are those are real real concerns. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to tweak it a little bit. We're gonna we're gonna um move the the conversation. What are some of your? I'm gonna, we're gonna go with your personal six, like your favorite education successes. This is, this can be anywhere in your career. This doesn't have to be veterinary. This can be when you were a student, it can be when you're a teacher, like just what comes to mind um, when I say your education successes, like that, boom. Education you know. successes. Um, oh gosh, I, I hope I don't <laughs> um, embarrass this, this student, um, but I, I don't think she'd mind. Um, 
I, I worked with a student, it's one of my most recent and favorite successes. I worked with a student on an independent study, um, I guess a couple years ago now, and she was just fabulous. She was just great, um, really um, didn't need very much direction, really a self-learner, a self-starter, and I just came up with some really good information. We ended up um, presenting together at the AAVMC conference this past March. Um, and so I got to see that sort of come full circle. So see all the work that she did come to fruition at a national conference presentation and get that on her CV. And, um, and she doesn't want to go into academia is what she tells me, but I've been trying to convince her <laughs> for at least a good nine months now. Um, but the class she was in didn't, they weren't able to have their white coat ceremony mm. because of COVID, of course. Normally they have that um, just before they enter the first year at Tennessee. So um, she's having the white coat ceremony now later in January. And it's been a couple of years now. And she asked me to be her coder. Aw. Uh, that's <laughs> and, it's wonderful. Um, yeah, and it's just knowing that you really wanted a student to succeed and you really tried to bring them into some things that can help and you hope that they see that you're doing it for the right reasons. And when it seems like they understand that, that's just a wonderful thing. Yeah, that speaks to the power of, of, of good mentorship too. And, um, that's obviously, uh, you know, speaks a lot to, to you, Misty as well, and the impact that you've had. Um, and yeah, congratulations on that. That's very exciting. Yeah. Thanks. I, I you know, I'm reflecting on that. I've had, I'd say probably 10 to a dozen summer research students uh, and, and probably the same number of undergrads that have gone to vet school. And Ms. you saying your mentee is not interested in academia. I am pretty sure I'm batting zero. <laughs> like, I don't think that anyone that I've gotten involved in doing research that I'm like, academia is awesome, has gone into academia. So... I, that that could just be me, to be fair. Um, <laughs> I doubt but I'm it. curious, like Misty, what your perspective mm -hmm. is on on having that experience, at least with that one mentee. Like, what mm -hmm. what can be done to, you know, because getting faculty recruited is a challenge for all vet schools. Mm -hmm. Like, can yeah. be done. Do you think at like those lower levels to to get the pipeline better, basically? Yeah. Oh wow. I mean, that's a challenge. I I think their their ideas that they wanted to be a veterinarian you know for as long as I can remember um possibly making a switch to academia and changing that trajectory I think is what they think about but I've also heard students say that you know I see how hard the people on the clinic floor work um and I'm just not sure I'm willing to do that um so I, I think that speaks to work-life balance too and and the challenge that we see with that and, and well-being um, across the profession as well. Um, so maybe, you know, I don't have a magic wand or magic solution by any means, but I, I wish they could somehow see how passionate we are about teaching and that sometimes the reason that we stick around late is because we're passionate for teaching. And it's not necessarily a bad thing to stay an extra 30 minutes. Um, sure, if you're taking yourself away from your family entirely every single night, that's one thing. Um, but if, if teaching and academia gets you so excited and you're so passionate and it really just makes your day, I wish they could just really see that and that we could let that come out instead of, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm the worst too. I like to, um, feign, um, discontent, I guess. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a chronic complainer, but it's always in a joking way. Um, and I, I hope that, that students don't 
see that in me that that I complain and I think it's a terrible terrible job because even though I'm like oh gosh I can't believe this happened again I actually love that that happened again (laughs) (laughs) say I don't know that I believe that you're a chronic complainer Misty like I I I just don't I don't buy it (laughs) I think students are probably they're pretty perceptive I think they know pretty well but it it is a little it, it's nice to hear you you say that in that way because we I was telling Eric before you all came on that we had a town hall meeting with the class of 2024 today of, of which all of eight people showed up but hey eight people were there um but that was one of the questions they were volleying at us was you know well what are you doing to retain the talent what are you doing to retain the faculty because we see all these faculty that we love leaving and and one of the things we talked about was and I talked about particularly was trying to help them find a way to have that work-life balance, right? Like we understand that sometimes there's going to be a 10 or 12 or 14 hour day, but we also need to have models who demonstrate that you can, you can do that, but then the next day or the next week you take a six hour day and that's okay. And so I'm really glad to hear that you say that. And, and yeah, we were more than, I mean, I I would probably work 24 hours a day if I, if I wasn't married. Right. And Mm -hmm. I still wouldn't. Yeah. Oh, so I could because, because when I was single, I did, and and I wasn't necessarily work working, but I and not twenty four yeah, hours. I, I was I was I was literally waking up in the morning to go do my morning run and get showered so that I could go and work, and then I I, I was literally you know I mean when I was going through my doctoral program, I was going full time doctoral studies, I was working two jobs, and I was a graduate research assistant, mm-hmm. so I was essentially doing three full you know three part time jobs and going to school full time, and I, and I thought I was happy. So I, I just think that it's important then to, to recognize that, you know, it's, it's about priorities and that, you, and, and that's, I think the single biggest thing, and I have some evidence to support the single biggest thing that people want in their job is not money. No. It's work. It, they want, they want to be appreciated, number one, and they want to have a quality life number two, right? Mm-hmm. Which means that they don't have to be at work all the time. Yeah. And that, that God, it's so important. And and I, I'm being serious. Like I, I don't want to work 24. I love my job. Like I, I think anybody who spends time with me at work would, would see that. Um, <laughs> I love what I do and I'm super nerdy about it. And I get really excited about dumb things on the clinic floor. And I get like, I'm like, Oh my God, this is your first one of these. Aren't you like, why am I more excited <laughs> about this? And then, so I, like, I'm so excited about this, but I don't feel bad when I want to go home at the end of the day. And this was true when I was single. This was true. Like, I, I don't want to live at work. Like I, I do worry a little bit, um, about, you know, the, like the image that we, we portray in, in veterinary medicine. And I, I, I don't think anybody would accuse me of not working hard. Um, I work hard and I, I certainly, I, you know, when I'm on call and I, I have those moments where I'm like, Oh, Do I have to, do I have to come back in again? You know, but then I get there. I'm like, oh, but this is really cool. You know, I'm like, oh, this is very exciting. Or like, I, I, I know I can remember very, with a lot of clarity, the moment when I was like, I am do like, I I don't know if there's something wrong with me, but I'm doing the right thing. And I I, I was, um, as a faculty member, um, there was a social gathering, a work social gathering end of the year, big, like celebration for all the house officers. And, um, I was, I was back up on call for one of our emergency residents and I had to drive, you know, an hour to go help them with, uh, a, a GDV, a surgery case. And, um, and it was this, this residents like first time, you know, cutting this case and I get there and they'd done everything. You know, well, I helped with a couple little things. They did everything great, but there were a few things I'm like, Oh, I helped with this. And I showed them that. And they you taught some things and the case went really well. The resident was really proud of everything. And so I'm driving home. It's like, I don't know, two or three in the morning and I'm driving home. It's like 45 minutes to drive home middle of the night. Like I should be like, I should be, I mean, I was exhausted, but I was just like, man, what a good night, you know? And, <laughs> and I had this like epiphany where I'm like, what is wrong with me? You know? <laughs> But it was kind of like, I got pulled away from a social gathering that, you know, that that's disappointing. And it's the middle of the night. Uh, like I'm driving home, I'm, I'm missing out on sleep. And I was like, man, yeah, this is great. What a good night. <laughs> and so I'm like, I'm, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, you know? And I, we don't talk about that side of it enough, like how fulfilling those opportunities are. And I, you know, I hear things, you know, about people not wanting to go into academia and work at a university. And I've, I've had many residents over the years say, oh, I'm not cut out for that. I'm like, what does that even mean? <laughs> yeah, you are. Um, you know, and so I, I just don't know that we, those of us that are in it and love it and are happy do a, a very good job of sharing this 
I love this and I choose this every day and I do have good work-life balance. Yeah. Sometimes I get called in the middle of the night and, and, but I, I get fulfillment from that. And there is a trade-off, right? There are other times when I say, I don't feel bad when it's time to go. And I trust you guys, you have this and I'm out of here. Um, so you know, how are we, we're not talking about that enough. Um, you know, Missy, I know you get excited because you nerd out about this stuff too. Oh, absolutely. Maybe, not, maybe, maybe not about a GDV at two o'clock in the morning, but you nerd about the, the, the education stuff. I've heard you and mm-hmm. you hear it in your voice and we're not connecting with the, the next generation as much as I think we, we could, or we should, because I'm like, why doesn't everybody want to do it? What I do is awesome. <laughs> um, how, how are other people not getting this? So I, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I think part of one of the solutions is to not let them do research with Eric. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We, we Eric, determine the cause of the shortage of <laughs> first authors on their publications. No. Yeah. Uh, I know. I, I, I agree. I may not be. I'd like to think. No, I'm a, no, no. That's not true at all. But you said like, you know, it's okay to stay a half hour, hour late. And I think that oftentimes we create this concept of work life balance and that it's a dichotomy right. and not realizing that work can be fun and satisfying and that be okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 One can, can fulfill you for the other and can energize you for the other. And mm-hmm. I had a great day at work. And so I can go home and be like, oh my gosh, what a great day. And Hey, mm-hmm. let's make dinner and let's, you know, whatever, let's be excited about it. And now I'm energized to do X, Y, or Z. And, um, or I had a bad day and, you know, work can or uh, you know, go home and that can help or vice versa. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not about either or, right. It's, you know, how do we, how do we gain fulfillment from both? Um, no. And, and I, totally joking, Eric. I mean, I, we've worked together on projects. And no, I mean, you're probably right. You're probably right. No, 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 no. Yeah, I, it's, it's kind of one of those, it's kind of one of those, um, correlation, not causation situations. That's right. Right. I, I think, I, I think probably. like you, Bobby, it's so self-evident to me why this is awesome. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, do I need to tell you? I, <laughs> I work six months a year. <laughs> I work six months a year. You can't top that going into practice. Don't give me your four day work week. Yeah. Like I work six months a year because I don't see like my off client time as work. Like that's my fun time. I'm doing right. research and teaching and everything. So yeah, well, I, that's, that's exactly it though. Right. It's the fun part that we mm-hmm. forget. You're right. Like I'm reflecting on how I present academia to students and I'm like, but I don't know that I've talked to them about the fun, right? Like how fun things can be like the first time. So we just had a paper published in a group of seven um, folks. And the first author is a, is a licensed veterinary technician who's literally never done research before. And because we were in a group of people who were willing to let this individual who really didn't probably contribute as much as she we would normally have expected a first author to contribute. She contributed a lot, but we were like, no, we want to lift you up. We want to give you the opportunity to, to see this paper, this work that you've contributed to. And it's like, it's awesome, right? To know that now that no matter what this LVT does in the rest of her career, she can always say, I'm the first author on this paper with five veterinarians and another veterinary technician. And how cool is that? Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, we don't, we don't talk about that enough. We don't talk about the the really lovely things that we do and that we get to experience on a regular basis. I mean, there's all the sort of like, oh, I just love teaching because of that, you know, that, that light bulb moment that you get, right? That's the sort of canned answer. And it's true. It's, I'm not, I'm not, not trying to minimize that, but there's so many other things yeah. that we get to do on a regular basis that are really cool. And um, yeah. I also don't want to minimize the importance of learning the things you don't want to do, right? Like oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. Also, you know, getting experience and being like, that was really cool, but, you know, I don't want that to be the entirety of my career. Um, But I also think some of those people may circle back later. Yeah. You know, oh. getting that experience and exposure where you're like, oh, that's not that good. And then you go back, you're like, actually, that was that was pretty awesome when I when mm-hmm. I look back on it. So um, you never know what um, what impacts or influences that's going to have. Um, but it, 10, years. It is okay. 10 years, Eric, some of your folks yeah. are going to they're going to come back. Yeah. They're going to come. They just haven't had the like, time to realize it yet. Yeah, That's that right. Hoffmeister man, he, yep. he's the one. So, got to do those longitudinal studies before we can make any conclusions. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Okay. I don't want to, I I don't want to take up too much of everybody's time, but I also don't want to miss out um, on an opportunity to hear um, Misty from you on like, give me one or two of your favorite teaching tips. Like what are your like, okay, this is, uh, you know, and it can be big, small, it doesn't matter, but like, what are, you're like, all right, I'm an expert in this. I'm really good at this. What are your (laughs) tips um, for those that are listening for um, teaching any kind of teaching? Um, 
So I, I think one that I think, um, Eric, we all know professional um, educators. Yeah. So um, I won't go into complete detail about this one, but um, I like to start a lecture with part of a story that mm. relates to the lecture mm. and then do a reveal at the end. Um, yeah, I loved so that. That was so much fun today. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Now you, I don't. Now you're gonna tell us what. Tell us the story. Oh, gonna, you have to. Go oh back. no no no! No, no, no not tell that, that one on here. <laughs> yeah. Should have that's, started the podcast a, with a story. Well, now we're gonna have to do that another time. Start. Yeah, we'll have to do that another time. Um, but yeah. So um, I think Eric, you know this book too, Small Teaching by James Lang. Mm. So one of the techniques that he talks about is prediction mm -hmm. as a way to get students to learn. And he talks about a specific time where he was betting with a group of friends on a March Madness basketball game. And then even 15 years later, he remembers that game that he bet on better oh, than man. any other game during March Madness that year. And so he uses that example to talk about how if you are looking for the answer to something that you're trying to predict, you're able to retain the information. Um, so I feel like if you can give students a snippet of information and have them searching for that answer the entire lecture or the entire session, and then it's revealed at the end, hopefully they can retain some of it and remember some of it a little bit better. Um, Curiosity is a powerful motivator. Yeah, mm -hmm. that plays right into my my idea of going into the first year classroom and the professor. Yeah. Yep, absolutely it does. A little mystery, right? Yeah, don't give yeah. them all of it. Yeah, save some totally for the end. Mm -hmm. Totally. Can you do that over an entire semester? Would that be like right? That yeah. Like what? What? What would you do? What would you like? Do? You just like like make mm -hmm. it like a mystery, like a, a mystery novel, and you just give them clues every every um, class time. <laughs> I don't. This is getting elaborate, but you know. <laughs> oh wow! It sounds like the cliffhanger of the TV, of the the TV show, <laughs> right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're gonna have to wait for season mm -hmm. two. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> See you next year. <laughs> That might be fun. Oh my gosh, the four of us, we have so yeah, much fun. Roll with this. <laughs> I think we really need to roll with this somehow. Um, come up with like, not a murder mystery, but you get the, you know, I, hmm. maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe, I mean, maybe it is starts with like a death though, right? Like there's a dead body at the beginning and then <laughs> you like reveal clues of how you figure, I don't know. I'm, I don't, I'm not, we'll have to play with this a little bit more. Oh, um, yeah. Those are like the most, what's that? Not supposed to be the one who's drunk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> one of the reasons I don't drink. I don't need to. Um, it's not necessary. It's dangerous um, for everyone else. The um, But like, aren't the most like popular podcasts about like real true crime and everybody's mm -hmm. loving this stuff right now. So just saying. Yeah. Oh my gosh. My brain immediately goes to like the intern, like screwed up something. <laughs> nope. right? That's going to be the misdirect. It wasn't That's the right. Yeah. That's right. That's going to be the obvious. It's yes. not the butler. It's never the butler. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. intern. Until it is. <laughs> it's turning into an Agatha Christie novel yes. or play, I think. Yeah. I think this has got to happen now. Um, <laughs> this sounds like fun. I want to do this now. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, can you top that tip? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm also really animated, um, so I'm 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 loud um, and and animated, and I try to use lots of inflection in my voice and try to make contact eye contact with lots of people in the class. Um, I I want to know that they're paying attention, and I even if they don't say a word, when I was a student, when I was an undergrad, I know you're going to find this shocking because the three of you know me fairly well. Um, I did not speak in class ever. I was shy. I was introverted. I was afraid I would say the wrong thing and I'd get embarrassed and people would think I said something crazy. Um, now I'm, I'm the total opposite. Um, <laughs> but I, while I was sitting there not saying anything and, and acting like you know, no expression on my face whatsoever. I was thinking, mm. I was thinking deeply of what was going on. And it, it sometimes I would go off um, on tangents of my own in my mind, you know, thinking about how things connected and then kind of come back to what was being said in class. So even if people are not responding with their faces, I try to keep in mind that it's not about me. Um, and, and there's a group dynamic, I think, that goes on with every class. 
you can be talking one-on-one -on -one with a student in your office and you know you're having this great dynamic conversation and then you get in a group or a cohort and suddenly the entire dynamic has changed mm -hmm. and um and and that student one-on-one -on -one seems like a different person because of this group dynamic so i i like to think that um that they're getting it and um, and if they're not and they're not engaged and, you know, they're scrolling through Amazon looking for um, a Roomba or whatever, um, <laughs> but that it has nothing to do with me. Yeah. So don't take it personally. That's a, that's a good outlook. I think that's good advice, um, not just for the, the folks that are in class and maybe aren't visibly engaging, but, you know, a lot of a lot of folks get really upset when students don't show up to class in person. Um, so I think two things you said there really are powerful is one like be animated, be excited. And I think that, you know, the students do feed off of that. Um, but also don't take it personally. Yeah, and there's all sorts of things going on. And if they don't seem particularly engaged, it, it might they might be more engaged than you're recognizing. And um, it might just be that this works better for them. Uh, this format does or, you know, they're thinking really hard about things. And um, yeah, I love that. That's that's actually really good. good advice for I think, new and and seasoned educators al alike. Yeah. yeah. Misty, the the being quiet thing, I I very much feel you on that because I said nothing until my senior year in vet school, and I actually remember my tipping point. And any of you who have been in a meeting with me know I have no problem saying anything now. Um, and I was in orthopedics, and the attending asked, you know, what's a radiographic image where we have a double epiphyseal image? And I'm like, oh, it's HOD. And I didn't say anything and nobody else said anything. And he was like, it's hypertrophic osteodystrophy. I'm like, I knew that that's the last time I'm going to be silent. Full stop. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm curious if there was any kind of tipping point for you with that regard. Yeah, it, it had to do it was similar experience to you, but it was in a literature class, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, yeah, so it was a literature class about, um, a 19th century novels, British novels, which I hate. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of um, Dickens, very depressing. Oh, you know, it was gray God. London. <laughs> it's basically what it was. Um, but we were reading Pickwick Papers by oh. Charles Dickens, you know, a novel like oh. you know that big, yeah. me not liking Dickens. I was struggling. Um, and I remember um, a professor asking the class, in one of the first class meetings, and and I already felt like I was behind all the other students because I I didn't come from a high school that had a lot of funding for books, and so you know I didn't read as much as everybody else had. So, you know, I fully expected that everybody in the room had already read half the material we were assigned, um, but apparently not. <laughs> so, at that time, he said, "So, what's this novel about?" We all, you know, just kind of look at each other and and I said, well, I feel like it's about classism. He goes, exactly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, it's so interesting because, and I don't know, Bobby, maybe you have a story too, but I had similar experience, right? Like, so I, I was a not a great student in the first three years of my curriculum. I struggled for a number of reasons, partly because of me and partly because of the instruction that took place. Um, and so I had very little confidence um, in what I what I knew. And so I didn't really speak out much either. Um, and we got to clinics and we were actually in a large animal rotation of all things. I'm not a large animal veterinarian. Um, and we were standing in front of a stall with a horse in it. And I don't even remember exactly what it was like you do, Eric, but I remember the, we were doing sort of a rounding situation. There were probably 12 of us. And, um, the clinician asked a question and I immediately like answered under my breath. And I was like, blah, 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 blah. And he just stood there and waited. And somebody was like, well, is it blah, 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 blah. And it was somebody who had stood right next to me and heard me say what I had said and oh. spoke it out. And the person and the, and the instructor was like, yeah, that's exactly right. And now to the credit of the person who said it, looked at me and goes, where the hell did you get that from? Like, how did you, where? And I was like, oh, well, we talked about that in second year medicine, blah, 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 blah. He was, and they were like, oh, okay. And I was like, okay, like I learned something. The mm -hmm. next time I'm not going to be so scared to say mm -hmm. something, but yeah. So mm -hmm. it's interesting that 
do, do you have a story like that, Bobby? Or were you, you seem maybe a little bit more gregarious, but I don't know. So yeah, my tipping point was um, what, like age two when I started talking, oh. whenever that was. <laughs> uh, I, have, um, I don't <laughs> story I have um my my problem has been the opposite um, shocker Bobby stop talking for a minute um so I <laughs> I'm aware and no one has ever accused me of being quiet um or of not talking enough um what I struggle with is the awkwardness of that silence I like so that was me as a student I mm. I was far more comfortable being wrong than I was with that silence. Like if the professor is standing at the front asking a question and I'm like, well, I'll give it a shot. I don't care. Like, I, no shame. I, I like missing the part of my brain that says you should either be intimidated or ashamed if you don't know something like, which I think has actually helped me, um, you know, and I also recognize, I think that I learn when I, when I'm wrong about something. And so I'm okay with it. Um, so I, so I, I have not ever struggled um, with not speaking up. I have struggled with shutting up um, <laughs> to give everyone else a chance to, you know, because my, my clock for when I'm uncomfortable is very short. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's, I've, I've had to learn that it's maybe not that other people, they just give them a second to think about it, Bobby. Like where I'm like, ah, nobody's talking. We have to say something, even if it's wrong. <laughs> No, we don't. We can give people a chance to take a breath and think about it. And maybe if you thought about it for a second, you'd actually come up with the right answer instead of shouting out the wrong one right away. Yeah. Uh, so you're, you're the student that you have to do the whole like, okay, I'm going to ask you a question. You're going to take two minutes to think yes. about it. Nobody can say anything. You're going to take two minutes to think about it and write it down. And then I'm going to come back and ask you to answer. Right. So yeah. you're the student that we need to. to that sounds like Bobby hell. Right there. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> no, that's okay. I mean, as long as I know, like, I, cause I've like, I've already been like, I've got my thing. I'm not going to overthink it. And so I just have to sit there quietly, but if I know that's the plan, I'm okay with it. Okay. Um, but it's when it's that awkwardness of somebody standing uh -huh. up there and like, okay, what does everyone think? And, and, you know, some instructors are better like saying things like that. Okay. Take a minute to think about it, but others start looking around immediately. Mm -hmm. And it sends me that signal that they expect us to know it right away. Right. <laughs> and so, so, um, uh, so I also have to, like, as an instructor, have to remember that as well. Like take a minute, like, it's okay. I I'm totally comfortable with the silence at the front of the room. Um, but uh, sitting, sitting down, I'm, I'm terrible at it. Um, so yeah, sorry. I, introvert, I, introvert, not... introvert, extrovert. <laughs> <laughs> Funny thing, I'm I'm actually more of an ambivert when it comes to where I get my energy from. So I'm not shy. I'm not afraid to like speak up, but I also do my, my I need my decompression time. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, but yeah, no, you guys are all sharing your stories. I'm like, wow, that's not me at all. <laughs> <laughs> and if I if I try to make up a story, there'd be people from my life who are like, no, you're a liar. <laughs> you're a liar. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's okay. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Takes all kinds, right? <laughs> For sure. Anyhow. Misty, this, this has been so much fun. Um, it's been so lovely to hear a little bit more about your background. Um, I think you may regret sharing that you have a background in like editing people's papers and, and manuscripts because I don't know about the others, but I'm like, oh, that's somebody else I can go to for help. <laughs> yeah. You could probably so, turn that into a business. You could make some money. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, it's it's been it's been lovely chatting with you and, and hearing more about you. And and thank you so much for for joining us today.